there and welcome to the Read Local Show presented by Lit Carnival and me, your host, Toy Thomas, author, blogger, and reading advocate. I am so excited to share today's guest with you. Dreema Jowrick writes speculative fiction that asks big questions. Let's meet her. How are you doing? I'm good, Toy. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited to um, learn more about you and your work today. But before we dive into some things, I did notice that you have um, been at a con or a book fair where you were like um, selling some of your books. Is that correct? Yes. What was that experience like for you? It was fun. It was educational. Um, But I'm really not too much of an extrovert. So it was a little bit a little, I had to get outside my comfort zone to do it, you know, and um, I've been lucky so far to share tables with other authors who are extroverts and who do bring people to the table. And then I can capitalize on that. On yeah. that you know? So, um, so it, it was fun. And it, especially at MarsCon, I loved seeing all the people walk by in their garb you know, their costumes and so on. And some of them were really amazing. That's so cool. that was fun. Yeah, Mars MarsCon is one of those ones that I've always wanted to go to either as a guest or um, uh, an attendee. I just never have. But I have been to their sister con, RavenCon. I've heard of that one too. Yeah. And I haven't had a chance to go to that one. It's but a I, fun I, time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just stopped. Uh, I would prefer to be behind the keyboard, you know, than out in, in public eye. So here I am on an interview, right? Yes. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Me so too. I kind of jumped in with that question, but I want to take a step okay. back for a moment and just have you give you an opportunity to just tell a little bit about yourself before we really get into the program. Okay. Well, um, by day, I am a legal secretary. And I work for a solitary attorney, a solo practicing attorney who has been practicing for more than 40 years. I swear if they drop this man into the middle of the most abandoned spot on earth within 10 minutes, he would find somebody he knew. So he knows everybody and he's a real joy to work for. And I really um, have learned a lot working there. When I'm not working, uh, I'm usually at the computer, either writing my next thing or editing my last thing or working on marketing or taking a class or m- any one of hundreds of other things that a writer has to be doing all the time. But I love it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And well, when I'm not doing that, I'm out in the yard. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's playing with, good. The, with the garden. So. Well, yeah, um, I did see there was some interest in some gardening, so we will probably talk about that a little bit later. Um, But I do think it's cool that for uh, those of us writers out there who maybe aren't doing it full time to be able to like have a day job that we enjoy doing. But then we also have that freedom to explore all of the writerly things that are just kind of part of who we are. Exactly. Yeah, I'm definitely not at the point where I could, you know, retire, but One day. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) All right. So I want to dive into it. So this little program is broken in, broken down into four parts because I feel like um, a writer is, is, is a person that just has multiple parts to them. And for me, um, being a writer starts from first being a reader. So I was always, always like to ask a few questions along those lines. So let's see, this is what I called on the bookshelf. So um, do you set reading goals for yourself? I don't because time is always an issue. And so I, I read on a Kindle Mm -hmm. and I had, we're in a tiny house. And so I don't have a lot of books, but I can borrow all kinds of books on the Kindle through Mm -hmm. Kindle Unlimited or through the library. And I take it with me everywhere. So I read, you know, if I have 10 minutes that I'm waiting for someone, I I read. If I get slow at work and there's no clients and no work to do, I read. But I don't set goals because I I, I just take 
the, the opportunities where I can, but I do read every chance I get. That's wonderful. I love that. Yeah. I think the whole goal setting thing is it's, it's one of those things where it's either for you or it's not. And right. either one is okay. Right. Right. Let's see what else I have here. Um, do you ever reread books? Absolutely. There are some books that are just comfort reads, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think the one that I have probably read the most often has, had, there were two different series. One was the Dune series, which is my absolute favorite, Okay. absolute favorite. And the Lord of the Rings books. I've read them a number of times as well. It's been a while. It's almost time again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see that. There, there are some books, like you said, that are just comfort reads. And so it's fun mm -hmm. to revisit them especially different parts in your life like I've noticed something that I read when I was younger and I reread it as an adult I still appreciate it but just in a different way exactly yeah all right and so the last question that I have for you and um this one doesn't apply to everyone but I always just like to see um based upon what you told me I'm thinking this may or may not apply because you're you are like me in the sense that I do kind of read where I can Sometimes it's just on the weekends, but if I can, you know, get in a couple of pages here or there, I will. But if you had, you know, the opportunity to, you know, know when you were going to be reading, is there a particular spot, a favorite like place that's like ideal for you to just sit and enjoy a good book? I, I would pick two different places okay. inside the house. I have, I have a chair. It is my chair, <laughs> but my cat has um, absconded with the space. And so she, he's sitting there more often than I am now, but it's a, a like a, a glider chair. So you can sit in, it's got an ottoman, you know, it's comfy. It sits over in the corner of the, of the living room. It's cozy. Um, when the cat is in the chair, then, and it's nice outside, then I will sit out on the deck, okay. either the front or the back of our house. And then I can watch the birds. You know, I can look up away from the screen every now and then and look at the birds. And I really like that. Nice. So, yeah, I love that. Yeah, I, I can relate to the the cat taking over your chair. My dog takes stuff for me all the time. Yes, <laughs> but um, I I do find that I'm a more of an indoor reader. But sometimes, if it's just the perfect day outside, I will sit up my little rocking chair out, outside and enjoy the breeze as I'm reading a good story. Oh yeah, I mean, if it's 95 degrees out there, or if it's 20 degrees, then probably not so much. But yeah, if it's no. nice, like it has been lately, yeah, I'm out there. Yeah, this has been good reading weather. <laughs> yeah, it has. <laughs> All right, so now I want to jump into the next segment that I call the open book, and this is where I get to find a little bit about you as a writer. Okay. And so the first question that I have is one that I don't ask a lot, but I started thinking about it and it might be one that I start asking people more. So for me, there is a distinction between being a writer and an author. I don't think that you can be an author without being a writer, but you can be a writer <laughs> without being an author. So with, with however you look at that, which word do you feel most comfortable? What do you feel describes you? Are you a writer? or an author? That's a good question. I've heard this discussion before, but I've never really thought about it. I guess, I guess if I had to, if I had to, mostly I call myself a writer, mm -hmm. but if you're published, then you're also an author. And so I do occasionally use that word, but mostly if people say, what do you do for fun? I say, I'm a writer. And they're like, oh, really? <laughs> okay. What's that about? <laughs> Yeah, I get that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The old, I, the, the old standby, tell me about your book in five words or less. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like we're going to be here a minute. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it, I, five words just isn't enough. <laughs> no, it's not. All right. Let's see. Um, and that's my dog. You stop. <laughs> so let's oh, he, see. he's fine. Okay, good. <laughs> so the <laughs> next question that I have is, what do you think for you is the most challenging part of the writing process? Most challenging. Possibly um, finding and making time, 
now, because there's not any part of writing that I don't love. Okay. I love the I love the planning. I love the plotting. I love the 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 actual writing of the first draft. I love the editing. I love the rereading. Um, I especially love the research. <laughs> so, I guess the hardest, most challenging part um, would would be finding and making adequate time to write as much as I'd like because it yeah. is hard. Maybe the second hardest part would be learning to use words other than just or head or yes, <laughs> nodded, you know? <laughs> yes. I have a whole list that I just search for them and I'm like, man, I use that way too many times. Yep. Yep. My editor is really good at pointing those out. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> that, yes. Thank you to all the editors out there who help yes. perfect our work. <laughs> yes. All right. And so since you um, kind of uh, mentioned it, you do um, obviously, you know, work with an editor, but there is a certain level of self-editing that a writer does. Sure, yeah. some people have a different approach to it. They will kind of edit while they're writing or they'll finish a draft, put it to the side, come back, edit it a little bit before moving on to another. Everyone's editing process is a little bit different. And even though editing is technically not writing, it is part of the process. So my Absolutely. question to you is, what is your editing process? Um, I, I try to set a word goal for myself um, every day and or I set a, a long-term goal like a 30 days out from now I want to have x number of words like a NaNoWriMo right and um so I don't edit while I'm writing okay I will sometimes when I come back the next day reread like the last page or two of what I wrote yesterday but I won't edit it I I do the whole thing I get it all on paper and then I sit aside for if I can, three to four weeks okay. and let it, and let it percolate. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then I pick it up and I have somewhat of a somewhat fresh view of it when I read it again. Um, I try to go through it a couple of times myself before I hand it off to my alpha reader, who is the Hubenstein. <laughs> and um, then I hand it off after that to beta readers. Okay. So yeah, I, I like that process. It's um an approach that I've tried myself. Um I, I find that I'm always flip-flopping with different processes, but I really like um the way you kind of you know go through it, just get it down without you know worrying about editing. You know, once you get that draft, then send it off. You know, I like I like that. That seems like a process that um I think would be very fluid and natural. Um, for people who like edit as they're writing, I don't know how they do that. I mean, it works yeah. for them, but I just feel yeah. like it would be, it would cut off my creativity if I did that. I Exactly. That's why I don't do it. If I try to edit as I'm going, um, it, first of all, it slows me way down, which is discouraging to me. And it interrupts the thought process and the flow of the story. Cause I, I swear, I hear the characters on my head. They're telling me this is what happens next. And if I interrupt them to go, Shh, I'm editing, then they might not talk again when I'm done. So I don't want to stop that process. Besides, by the time you get to the end, you know, if you edit it before you've got the whole thing fleshed out, then, you know, you might be whittling away a piece that you will need to add back in later. So I, that true. for me, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, I like that. That makes sense. Right. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I know sure. sometimes as a writer, it can be difficult to kind of talk about your process. So I'm always excited when I get to this part of the interview. But now it's time for the really fun stuff where we go to the section called a book signing, where we're going to talk about your work. We're going to talk about um, the basically the book that we're highlighting today. But of course, you can talk about other stuff, too. Um, my first question, though, I we, we chatted a little bit beforehand. I think you know what's coming. So <laughs> where did the title for Entheophage, did I say it? Yes, you did. Yes. So where did that title come from? What does it mean? It is a kind of a bastardized Greek 
word that I made up. And it basically taken apart means God in the phage. And a phage is a type of virus. Okay. So um, it this, the book identifies what it means, but not until that part of the story has started to happen. So if I go too much into detail, it'll probably be a spoiler. No spoilers, no spoilers. <laughs> but yeah, I just, I'm famous for making up words in my stories. I, I love most of my stuff is, <laughs> I mean, most of my stuff is speculative fiction. So if there's not a word to describe or to name what I need, I just make one up. I love that. that, that <laughs> I've, I've done that myself. I think that's one of the freeing things about writing speculative fiction is that you can do that and get away with it, you know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, I do have my copy of the book and I'm excited knowing that that's kind of where the title comes from. And there's something in there that I'm going to be, you know, learning about that as I read it. Um, yeah. I want to talk about if you, if you have any insights or maybe, I guess you could take this question in, in a different direction, depending on how it, it applies. I know as um, writers, sometimes we don't have a lot of say in the cover design, but I'm interested in either you know, any input you had in the cover or maybe what your thoughts on when you saw the cover for the first time. Let's talk about the cover. Okay. I would love to talk about the cover because the cover <laughs> is fabulous. It's fabulous. It is very nice. <laughs> that, let me, uh, there's a poster behind me, but mm -hmm. this is, this is the cover. Yep. Isn't that awesome? It is very, I love it. There's the back. Clearly, a piece of this story takes place in on a coral reef in the South Pacific, uh, if you didn't get a clue by the cover. So I found my cover artist. I self-published this okay. through my own publishing company. And I found my cover artist through a mutual friend. I, okay. I know that she is in um, the uh, graphic art industry and so I went to her first and said you know who do you know that would be a good fit for this for, for me for this and she introduced us and uh he's great he is um interesting that I haven't known him before because he and I have a lot of the same friends through the northeast community and um but he his company name is Corvid design like crows corvid design and he does several different types of packages for artists for cover designs okay. um the one i picked was probably the most expensive one of course and uh, <laughs> but it was a it was a deal where he i sent him a copy of the book and he read the full book nice and then designed a cover to match the story i i didn't tell him a thing. He designed three different covers. This was the one I fell in love with. And so there were only a few little tweaks to it after that. I was in love. I mean, it's that, perfect. That That's amazing because I, I, I've worked with some cover designers in the past and they're like, oh, just send me like a spec sheet. And it's never really like right on the money, you know, but like when someone reads your book and then designs because they are invested in the story. I think you get something that's more genuine. You have to do less edits that way. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I highly recommend Duncan. He, his name is Duncan Eagleson. He uh, has a lot of history in art and design. He's awesome. worked on the, he worked on the graphic, um, the, um, the Sandman graphic novels oh wow he's nice. done movie yes he's done movie posters he's done a lot he's got a huge long curriculum vitae of, of things that he's done that are very um respectable credits and so I felt comfortable turning this over to him and he's he's very professional he's very busy so if you want to have him do your, your cover, you'd have to give him plenty of time to do oh, yeah. cover because he's very busy. But um and, and it's not it's not cheap. Well, of course not. I mean you but it's I not cheap. 
you know, it doesn't right. look cheap either. So yeah. I was happy with it. I was very happy with it. And he has already um, submitted some concept designs for my next book, which is the first book in a trilogy. And okay. he's gone ahead and done concept designs for all three of the books. So I don't know when those are going to come out because I may query those. We'll see. Okay. That's so I exciting. Think I'm going I mean, to, so yeah, yeah. I mean, being able to find a cover designer that has already, you know, have so many accolades, and then you work well with them, then they yeah. produce something that you love. I mean, yes, that's just. I I hope to have that experience one day. I mean, I kind of had that experience where um I was a contributor to an anthology, and the person who like designed the cover for the anthology just like nailed it because they read all of the stories first and then designed mm -hmm. it. And it makes yeah. all the difference. It does. It really does. Because then they know all the little things that will make it special. So they, they're invested, like you said, and also they, I don't think Duncan could have done some of the things he did on this cover without knowing all of the little details of the story yeah you know so yeah. he he made it very personal and he made the the young lady on the front of the cover look just like the character so that's I don't, so know, cool. how he, I don't know how he did that <laughs> but that that's so that. cool though I, I love yes. hearing stories like that <laughs> yeah so my my question to you is um as far as like the book itself because I don't want to give too much of it away but I know that a lot of times when I'm writing something, I have an ideal like audience, like who, you know, which, what choir am I preaching to kind of thing? Right, right. And so like, who is this book for? Like, who is this going to appeal to the most? Who is just waiting to devour this story? I'm, I'm going to say people 30 to 45 years of age, it probably would appeal to people younger and older, but that's who I was aiming for it was 30 to 45 years old. Um, people who uh, have some feeling toward the environment. Yeah. Even if it's kind of a, yeah, I know we got problems, but that's not my issue. Right. Them especially I want to catch, okay. but, but, I, but I did not, I tried not to be preachy. So um, it does have a very strong environmental theme, but I, I worked very hard to not be preachy. And most of the people who have read it and reviewed it said exactly that it was not preachy, but yeah, it's a, I wanted to focus it on, especially people with kids. There are kids, the kids are the focus of this story. Oh, okay. And because in my mind, kids are the next generation. That's who we're leaving this world to, right? So, and I don't have any kids myself, but I think this book will appeal to um, people with kids who are, especially kids who are preteen um, or people who have a strong feeling about the environment and, and how, what we can do to make it, make it better. Nice. I, I like that. I, I I definitely think it helps when you're, you know, not necessarily like writing the book, but could be writing it, especially like when you're promoting it, if you have an idea, like who your audience is, because you want to like cater to them. So it's like exactly. for anyone out there who, like you said, 30 to 45 years old, cares about the environment, either has kids or is worried about, you know, the kids being in the future like, stuck with this world that we've left them. Like, mm -hmm. these are all the kinds of things that, I mean, they, that appeals to me, you know? So it's definitely, yeah. I think can make all the difference when you like know who your audience is. Right. Right. It, it helps you. I, I'm definitely a planner. Yeah. Um, and so it helped me to map out my story knowing what my target was does that make sense absolutely you can't, you can't shoot an arrow at nothing you have to know what you're aiming for and so that helped I think cool I like that well that is um all I have questions because I don't I don't like to ask too many questions about the book because I want to you know intrigue people enough to check it out 
but don't want to give away too many spoilers. So I personally am excited about this book and um, hopefully my viewers will be seeing a review of it soon down the road. Yay. There's right, a few so reviews out now on Amazon and Goodreads and BookBub. And so far it's getting good reviews. That's good. I'm going to love to hear that. That's cool. Yeah. So now I want to jump into... Um, what I call the silly section of the interview. Um, this okay. is called Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover. And these are just some questions that um, gives, tells us a little bit more about you. It could be about you as a person or you as a writer or, you know, just anything, just, you know, fun, silly stuff. But <laughs> knowing kind of the, <laughs> the message of your book and, you know, getting a little bit about your background, the first question that I, that I do have is going to be about gardening. I knew this question was coming up. So <laughs> I know that um, you've got some different projects going on with the garden. And I know you, you told me, you know, when we chatted before that there was a particular project that you had shared some pictures um, with me. Let's talk yes. about that project a little bit. Okay. You want me to tell you about it? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, we bought, I am 63. See this gray hair? <laughs> I'm 63. And I just last year, my husband and I bought a house for the very first time. And so we got this big yard. It's a small house, but it's a big yard and lots and lots of grass and what probably most people would call weeds. Right. But I love them because they're little teeny tiny wildflowers that bees love and butterflies yeah. love and other beneficial insects love. We need those guys. Yeah. You know, we need those bugs. And so I decided that I wanted to make our yard be as much as possible uh, Virginia native plants only. Nice. Now, I am not, you know, I'm in front of the computer all the time. So I'm not, you know, strong and you know, I don't work out a lot and all that. But, um, <laughs> my husband and I both got a workout when we did this because we started with a grassy corner in our yard mm -hmm. and we had to dig up the sod for the area that we wanted the garden to grow. And because of the one of the main things that I put in the garden will spread out to like six feet wide. Okay. Eventually, we had to make it big enough, you know. So we spent a whole weekend probably out there cutting and hoisting up the sod and then because we don't have a wheelbarrow dragging it over to low spots in the yard and putting it down you know without so, a wheelbarrow without a wheelbarrow you know what we did we took an old cardboard box and we tied a rope through the end of it and I used that as my um what did I call it my my I can't remember what I called it now but it was my little gardening buddy I just used it to drag those plots of dirt and you know those suckers are heavy those little yeah. plots of dirt that you dug up so we dug it up it all the way back into the corner and like in an arch. Mm -hmm. And then we um, we had gone to the Virginia Native Plant Garden um, sale mm -hmm. early in late March or early April, I think. And we bought the plants that we wanted to get, some of them anyway, and brought them back home. And then we went to a garden shop in Norfolk that sells this one shrub I wanted in a native Virginia version. It's a, a beauty berry and it, it gets the most beautiful purple berries on it in, in the fall, the late summer and early fall. And the bees and the bugs love and the birds love it. Okay. So, I mean, I everything that we put back there is native and it will feed the birds. It will feed the butterflies. It will feed the bugs. And I've already seen a butterfly out there that I had never seen before in my life. Wow. So it's already paying off and it's not even completely mature yet you know so that's wonderful I actually saw an article recently about some people I don't remember which state it was but I'm sure if it's happening in one state it's probably mm -hmm. happening in others where they actually had to fight with their um homeowners association because they wanted to have a, a, a yard filled with native plants instead of grass they won yes. the case so but the fact that they had to fight for that because Everybody's like, oh, we just want grass, but they're like, we want to help the environment, you know? Exactly. I mean, first of all, a plant that's native to your region takes less water, less care, 
you know, it's going to be stronger and, and more hardy than some grass that you import. And grass is pretty, yeah, but so is a yard full of these blooming flowers with butterflies yeah. and bees. That's that to me is way more beautiful than a yard full of grass. I I love that. And I am rooting for you guys to just have a whole field. And it, I know it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> Eventually, but you know, we're not as um, energetic as we were 20 years ago. So it's going to be slow, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Exactly. We have one corner done. <laughs> and hey, that you said it's going to stretch out like at least six feet, right? Yes. That one, sh well, that one shrub. So the, the, the garden we've dug already is, uh, is more than six feet wide. Okay. So, so yeah. All right. Well, we're very excited. I'm so excited to hear about that when, when you kind of mentioned it to me and you sent the picture. So um, like I said, I'm rooting for you. Thank you. So the next question I have is a silly one. Um, I do have to caveat this one. So I guess it all depends. Do you remember the show <laughs> Golden oh. Girls? I do, but I never really watched it very much. Oh. I, I've, I've, I, I really, there were some TV programs that I watched, but, and I did see that one a little bit here and there, but not a whole lot. All right. So were you a fan? Well, I saw it in syndication. And so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of a fan. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, the question that I was going to ask, so you may not be able to answer it, but I was going to say, you know, which of the Golden Girls would be like your best friend? Wasn't Betty White one of them? She was, yeah. Th then I'm going to pick her because <laughs> I love me some Betty White. <laughs> yeah, She's, she was so great. Um, yeah. I think it was the, she died the day before like her 90th birthday. Yeah. I mean, I know, I know she, she was like almost 90, but it was like too soon. Wasn't ready. I know she could be 150 and it would be too soon. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to move on to the next one. So this one is one that I like to ask writers just because it's kind of cringy <laughs> not that I am like indulging in cringy things but it is a would you rather kind of question so okay if you had to remember you don't have a choice but these are the choices would okay. you rather publicly burn one of your books or give away all your royalties for the rest of your life give away all my royalties for the rest of my life yeah Especially if I could give them to somebody, to to a, a an organization that was going to help other people. Yeah, that, I, I would do that. that. No, no problem. Yeah. Given the choice of burning my book, mm, no. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I, I think um, that the few people that I've asked it to that that was kind of the answer. They're like, no, I'm not burning my book. I'll give it away. You know. So yeah, yeah. yeah I feel that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'd be almost like setting fire to well maybe not setting fire to your kid but you know what I mean I know what you mean yeah. I know what you yeah. mean <laughs> it's not there, quite the same but you know it's, it's not it's not quite the same but it is an emotional attachment to something very, that you created very yes yeah very strong one <laughs> well we have come to the end I've had so much fun um so I, I am going to kind of bring this to the end. I would love if you would just kind of tell our viewers where they can find you and your work online. Okay. I should have written this down. Um, I am on Facebook and on Twitter and on uh, Instagram, though I have to tell you, I'm not very active on Instagram. I don't get Instagram yet. I haven't been on there very long and I haven't quite figured out how it works and I don't have a lot of time to play with it. So I've posted some pictures and I've tried to post a couple of uh, fellow authors books, but I haven't figured out quite how to do that yet. So uh, I'm most active on Twitter as uh, I think I'm at uh, Drew Majoric. And um, on Facebook, you can find me at Niveum Arts. It might be Niveum Arts LLC, but if you type in Niveum, N-I-V-E-Y-M Arts, A-R-T-S, you will probably find me. And, and I have a newsletter. You can sign oh. up for it on my website, niveumarts.com. 
Awesome. Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. So um, to the viewers, I want you to make sure you stick around because Dreama has a nice little teaser to share with you for her book. And for my Patreon subscribers, she's got something especially good for you guys. So until next time, guys, stay safe, be blessed, and have fun reading. Thank you.